Hello, friends. Welcome to Sunflower Club. My guest today is Sophie Strand. Sophie is a writer and poet who blends spirituality, storytelling, and ecology to reimagine ancient myths for the modern world. She is the author of two books, The Flowering Wand, a collection of essays aimed at rewilding the sacred masculine, and her new book, The Madonna Secret, a historical novel about Mary Magdalene, which offers a retelling of the story of Christianity. Sophie is one of my favorite writers and one of the smartest people I know, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Sophie, first of all, how are you doing? I'm so excited to speak to you. You just released your, not your first book of the year, but your second book of the year. Um, I'm excited to talk about both of them. Um, but first of all, how are you doing with um, all of the newness of um, stepping into the world as you have this year as a, as a voice and an author? Thanks, James. Um, I mean, I think it's been a frog in boiling water experience over the past two and a half years that I went from being a ghostwriter, so I'd like a person who wrote other people's books or projects for them, like wore another mask, another face, to very slowly seeing my work spread on social media, giving talks, having my work be published. And I think that, you know, it was a slow gradient of exposure. Um, and, but recently it's been a lot. Um, I, it's been incredibly validating. I wrote this book at a time in my life when I wasn't sure, given the fact that I have an incurable genetic illness that goes in and out of severity. Um, I wrote it at a time in my life when I thought my life was perhaps going to be greatly abbreviated and that I had a very limited amount of time. And so I wrote it in a state of great urgency. I thought if there was only one story I could write, what story would I write? I always say it was like a Scheherazadean impulse. Like, you know, that's the frame narrative for the 1001 Nights of the Arabian Tales. This woman is married to a king who kills her husband, uh, kills his wife every night, marries a new woman. So she has to tell a series of stories that convince him to keep her alive. And so for me, this book was very much a Scheherazadean impulse, which is what story would I want to write if I could only write one story? And what story has enough sustenance, enough complexity, um, enough of my own desire inside of it that it could keep me alive? Um, and so I do think there's a strange experience where now that it's out, so I finished it almost five years ago, but publishing happens at such a delayed route that, you know, it takes a while to get an agent, then a publisher, then edit, oh, yes. they schedule it. So in a strange way, it's been finished for a long time, but it hasn't been moved and alchemized by the organisms of other re readers hasn't been taken over and gardened by other people and so i think that there's this really beautiful thing when the energy distributes when you feel like the tension of holding this one story in your body begin to relax as other people take it and hold it but then there's the other sense which is i did the thing i said i was going to do now i can die <laughs> so i do think that every writer has perhaps had some kind of experience with letting a project go with grief and celebration and also a sense of vulnerability um what Absolutely. i mean you're you're so prolific in the amount of poetry and work you you give very freely what is your experience of finishing a project and releasing it that's such an interesting question you know it's um the release is a big part of it you know publishing something um, cause I have, I have books that are unpublished also that I have been either done for a long time or that I've been in development for a long time. And it's almost like there's a stuck energy in the body. Yeah. It's like, I, I, I think the creative process is a lot like there's a, there's a lot, there's a, there's a physical and energetic equivalent to, um, maybe like having emotions that are, that are stuck in the, in the, in the system, or maybe even suppressed. And in order to move past them or heal from them, there's a certain amount of release that needs to happen. And, oh, yeah. um, the, the release or the publication or the sharing in public of, and this is what my like sunflower club is all about is like, um, creative public creative expression, because yeah. especially when there's something to be, when there's a receiver, 
Um, and then it's like you can pass the ball to somebody and they can catch it and then pass it back through their feedback mm -hmm. and just through the reception of it. Um, I feel like the creative process can finally has some kind of a bit of a, of a conclusion. So it sounds like you have a, you just purged some long stored, stored up energy that's been lingering in your system for years now. Yeah. Um, so I can imagine that that must feel good to, to finally get that out of your system. Yeah. I mean, I think that in, within capitalism, we have this idea of ideas as belonging to people and as authors, as being these atomized individuals who come up with these things and then produce them on their own. That's a recently created concept. You know, most of storytelling happened in a kind of rhapsodic way, whereby there were many homers that you stepped into the role of Homer and no one owned a story. A story was an event that a culture kept alive by literally breathing it into being each time it was told anew. And so I am always trying to interrupt my own idea that I should perfect a story, I should make it uniquely mine, and then when I give it away, it still has to be attached to me in some way. We're so precious with our art. We, you know, I, I oftentimes say that ideas are like hot potatoes, that when the tidal wave comes, when climate change really begins to collapse things, you don't wanna be holding your idea. Yeah. Um, you've lost if you're still holding on to your idea, give it away to someone else who might think it better. Give everything away freely. Nature is profligate. I mean, like, look at how many seeds and spores, flowers and mushrooms release. Like, they are not, you know, thrifty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are just giving it all away. Yeah, what uh, one thing that I've been realizing that even the flowering wand maybe even helped accelerate my my learning of this was how outdated the concept of the, the, um, the rugged individual list artist and the and the and the personal genius like maybe like the Ernest Hemingway or like you know <laughs> writers that I or Picasso you know people that I that I do like as creatives but just the the paradigm of art that we are hopefully coming out of which is like this is the this is this expression of my personal genius and come and marvel at the <laughs> what I have created where I think I I like to think that we're moving into or more returning back to uh, a, a communal understanding of art, both in its creation and in its consumption. Um, and it's about kind of expressing and really healing together and being witnessed and, and receiving each other um, instead of, you know, and kind of extracting the capitalism out of creativity. So we're not in competition to reach the highest peak of the mountaintop, we are all more in a circle sharing together and that is collectively better for everyone. I mean, I would hope so. I think one of the interesting precarious elements of social media and the digitization of, of information and the, the onslaught of information. I mean, we receive on a second by second basis more information than we could ever make sense of that. You know, I've heard some complexity theorists say that, Conspiracy theories are the only model we have for understanding and creating a stable value system out of this level of chaotic information overload. Um, we don't have any other systems that actually help us to navigate this. So we can have some empathy for people who get really embroiled in that type of thinking. And I do, but I do think, you know, while that's a very morally explosive terrain, it does mean that art ideas, and this is what you work with, with memes, move too quickly to be, to ossify, to become out of date with the current situation. They're always adapting, they're moving through other people, they're infecting other people, and thus they're alive. They're responsive to being questioned and interrupted and evolving. Um, and so I think there's something about how fast information and art and ideas move through super, super social media that on the one hand allows for a kind of superficial engagement, such that you always feel like you don't know the new pop psychology, you don't know the new theory, what you're saying isn't woke enough, like there's that flip side. But on the other side, it means that ideas are slip out of people's hands and evolve and get better at a much higher um, rate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about your journey getting here. I, you mentioned that you were a ghostwriter. I find mm -hmm. that so fascinating. And I Man, those people who had you as a ghostwriter, honestly, so lucky. <laughs> no, because just from a writing perspective, like I love the content of your work as well. But I mean, the mm -hmm. writing itself is so is so poetic. Is this something now you've fast forward 
a year, you have two published books that are, you know, Sophie, they're getting really good reception. You know, I hear what people say uh, about you and your work, both online and, you know, around me and um, people have a lot of respect and love for your work and you're making a real impact. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. And also, is this something that you that you dreamed for yourself as a as a as a child? Is this um, is this something you always kind of envisioned, or how does it feel like to be in, embodied in this new reality um, after years of working toward it? Thank you for asking, and for that generous reflection back. Um, it can be so vulnerable putting your work out, especially when it has personal content in it, which a lot of my work is about disability, trauma. So it can be scary. Um, there are two sides, two kind of competing narratives. So on the one hand, I was raised by writers. My parents have worked in and around publishing my whole life. And I was, you know, as the survivor of earlyhood childhood trauma, one of my life rafts, one of the things that saved my life were densely researched, lush, oftentimes pretty queer historical fiction and fantasy. And these big, dense books that I could just like dissolve into. And it also gave me alternative visions of how kids with trauma can become wizards. I mean, Harry Potter is a mess, but like, you know, it was helpful to imagine that like some kid who has a is neurodivergent and weird and having weird experiences can still somehow have friends and thrive. Um, and so those stories, you know, in particular, I was very drawn to the queer Greek life writer Mary Renault and all of her incredibly well-researched books about Alexander the Great. Um, and so I always knew that I wanted to write. I knew that I the thing that I loved the most were really long, well-researched historical fiction books and that I would love to be able, I would sometimes think of like a mountain way far off. And I was like, there's no way I could get the amount of schooling, the amount of research, the amount of chops to be able to write one of those, but gosh, wouldn't, that would be the thing I'd most want to do. And so in a lot in a lot of ways, I've done what I really most wanted to do when I was like six or seven. And so that feels so powerful. I oftentimes I texted my group of best girlfriends that were still friends from when we were 12. And I said, like, this book was for us. Like we would pass around Outlander or The Red Tent by Anita Diamond. And like, you know, these books were our shrines, our altars together. Um, and so that feels like the fulfillment of a dream. And I've always been interested in writing. I knew, because I saw how hard it was for my parents, that even selling books won't necessarily support your life, that you have to really hobble together lots of different freelance gigs, and then it's always a struggle. So I knew going to college, going to college, I thought I would be an academic. Like, I would eventually write novels, but the thing I was, I was mostly getting acclaim for very sterile academic poetry, I was studying medieval literature and it looked like I was going to go into a narrower and narrower niche and like specify in medieval manuscripts um, and saints lives. And I was, you know, in a certain way, I was saved by that by becoming much too ill to go on to grad school at the end of college and being forced to look at my life with like a microscope and say like, if I'm going to die, what do I do? I don't want to spend the next six years in school still. I need to figure out what I care about. And so it was a dream, but it was a distant dream. The thing that I never dreamed of, and I'm having, I'm definitely having a lot of curiosity about is being a public figure. For whatever reason, I thought being an author was suddenly have enough money to become a crazy cat lady and buy all the books you want. Um, and for me, the idea of authorship was always very um, private. And it was, I think it was still based on an older model where, you know, you could have your farmhouse, you could sell an occasional book, maybe do an interview, but mostly you were just writing and able to write professionally. And so that was a little bit of a fiction. Um, and I could see that it was a fiction, but I still didn't totally grok it. And now my, in fact, well before I got published, I became a person who was front facing and, and whose life was visible to other people and who was talking to a growing number of people who I didn't know personally. And that's been something I never envisioned for myself, but it's, it's challenged me. Like, I think I think better because I think in a community of people who challenge my ideas, 
give me research. Like, I think it's really important for people to share their writing and process with the people who care about their writing, their readership, so that th that readership can say, this works, this doesn't work. I think my work has gotten better because I risk it on the readers who care about me. Mm. And I think that there are parts of this, this aspect of being visible that are as a queer, disabled, female identifying person who lives alone are scary. You know, I've recently been dealing with people who have been trying to locate me and come into my home. And that's been a whole new thing for me to deal with that I never mm. expected to have to deal with. Um, but on the other hand, I'm held by a community of queer disabled people who we, by the function of our weird bodies, could never visit each other or find each other. But we've found each other through this wild digital western experience of, I, you know. I love that i love the idea of a tribe of misfits right and i think yeah. art art is what art is what, art art is the um it's the rallying cry for the the tribe of misfits that where you can find each other and like yeah you know you might live alone in the hudson valley but you can communicate with people all over the world right. who are also feeling alone in their isolated little pockets but it's also amazing to me because you know you know i haven't known you or followed your work for super long, but I, it seems like you've handled this transition so well and with so much grace. And uh, there's something so interesting about, you know, you thought your work was going to be more, you know, I, I guess esoteric or um, have it limited in its scope of its <laughs> audience, but there's something about in the personal and in the minute is the universal yeah. and the vast. And you really are having people um, relate to it who maybe don't even share your same life experiences and uh, yeah I was really blown away initially by the flowering wand which was it's funny my um my wife um bought it for me and she says she I, I guess I'm, I'm very picky in terms of you know buying gifts for she claims it's only one of two gifts she's ever gotten me that I was excited about <laughs> The other is a big French press. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good gift too. Wow. Yeah. But then all but then but then when I heard you on podcasts, I was like, oh wow, this translates so well to speaking and like um you're just so sharp and quick and well versed in so many topics. But one of my favorite, um, I I, I kind of think of this like your tagline in my mind. I don't know if it was on your Instagram bio or maybe your Substack or something, but you compared yourself to compost. Oh yeah. And and you said that you you, you like your desire was to be good compost. Yeah. And I have reflected on that a lot and I just I really love that statement for a few reasons. It's so simple and humble. Um you know, I I kind of consider myself in the lineage of the American poetry tradition of like Walt Whitman and Allen Ginsberg. Um, I have my Howell tattoo right here. Ginsberg was like one of my first formative writing influences. And uh, one thing that he said was make mantra of the American language. Mm. In other words, the plain spoken um, language and, and just everyday life around us has as much wisdom as any fancy tradition or, um, you know, foreign culture that we can go after. And there's something about compost that is just such a, it's such a humble word and thing. Um, it's literal rotting garbage in one, in one, in one sense, but, you know, people talk about things like reincarnation and they debate whether or not reincarnation is real. Well, it's like compost is literal reincarnation, <laughs> like right in front of your face. Um, I also love, it feels to me like being compost would be transmuting everything you experience and consume into something of value. So in other words, all your experiences, all of the books you read, all the conversations you have, all the music you listen to, you this is an internal alchemization process. And then you produce soil, which could be your books or your art or the, just the gifts that you, that you give to the world. So that's my interpretation. And what I like about you comparing yourself to compost, I'm just curious, what, what does that phrase mean to you? 
Well, I love hearing all of your kaleidoscoping around it as well. Um, and bringing up Whitman and Ginsburg, you know, um, Whitman, I can't quote it, but Whitman has an extraordinary poem called This Compost, one of my favorite poems of all time. Um, so just a side note to listeners to look that one up. Um, for me, you know, I'm finishing right now a memoir, an experimental memoir collection of essays called Body is a Doorway, Healing Beyond Hope, Healing Beyond the Human. And the kind of central essay is Confessions of a Compost Heap. And the idea is if your condition is incurable, if you cannot integrate the trauma, if you are terminal, or if you or if you fail healing, what kind of wellness is allowed to you? You know, where do you fit in the story um, of American wholeness and optimization? Um, and so for me, you know, for so many years, when I first got sick, I didn't have a diagnosis. And then I got different diagnoses, got sicker, long process. And but by the time I finally got a diagnosis, it was this kind of double edged sword of thank God, here's the answer. It does fit. It will kill you in this slow degenerative way and there's no cure. So very tricky thing to hold. And I think for me, I was struggling so hard against the ways my body was breaking down and feeling like I was always failing, no matter how many green juices, energy cleanses, medicines, traumatic models I paid money and time to, I couldn't keep up with the level of decay in my body. Like I was always slipping. And so I was always rendering my body deviant in relationships to some fake Edenic Garden of Eden body, some whole body of me that had has maybe never ever, ever existed. And so I started to say, you know, we live in this culture of optimization, sterilization, antibiotics, antibiosis meaning against life, not necessarily the life-saving drugs, but we think we can clean up forests and they'll function better, clean up our guts and they'll function better. But the truth is that resilient ecosystems work in as much as they have complexity, more nodes of connection, more species, and they could respond to anthropogenic harming climate change better if they're more complex. Same goes for our guts, our psyches, our bodies. And so I started to self-conceptualize myself as a compost heap, which is my body's breaking down, but I don't have to problematize that all the time. I can say it's maybe something really interesting is happening here. Maybe I'm not working towards a whole body, but I'm breaking down to make the soil where people can plant their stories and their lives. I'm just trying to do enough with my worm infested, weird little pile such that it will be good food for other artists and other people. And for me, it was a way of problematizing my attachment to individual accomplishment and to individual health when I couldn't ever attain it. And so for me, compost heap is a very much a disability inspired term, which is I am, I've also, I am kept alive by many other beings. I am kept moving. And some days I'm more rot, some days I'm more ripe. Like who knows if I'm going to be sprouting something today or if I'm just going to feel nasty. So that was, it was definitely inspired by me beginning to challenge some of the healing paradigms I've been gifted with culturally that were feeling punitive. Um, but then on the other hand, it's also how I work creatively, which is by addition, never by subtraction. Like I'm not throwing out patriarchy, I'm throwing patriarchy in. Um, I'm not trying to excise the trauma. I'm throwing it into the garden with a hundred other bugs and salad greens and seeing what sprouts. So it also talks about how I inappropriately merge epistemologies, frameworks, ideas, things that are toxic, things that are good and try and see if they can create soil for more interesting ideas. So it's like, it's a kind of, it's a pedagogical approach, but it's also a practical way of me dealing with um, my own failing body. Thank you for sharing that. That, 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 that reminds me of um, like, like New York City, for example. Like I lived in New York City for eight years and it's like a lot of cultures just get, um mixed together and in in a sense like maybe the old culture there's a certain amount of decay happening because the the culture is like less and less what it was and it's it's kind of decaying into the the melting pot but then something new is created out of the <laughs> out of the collective decay and that's how i mean i am obsessed i'm a lover of biology and evolutionary biology and like deep evolutionary biology not a simplistic 
Darwin, neo-Darwinian approach, which is that actually most biological novelty doesn't happen when we individuate into different species, but happens when two species inappropriate appropriately merge. Mm. It can look like botched cannibalism. It can look like parasitism, but it's these moments of uh, horizontal gene transfer or body sharing, permanent body sharing that created the grounds for our bodies. Um, that created the syntropoblast layer of the uterus with a viral retro, um, a, a retrovirus that came into our systems. Like all of the things we think of as being sacred happened through an anarchic mergers that we would have initially characterized as being violent or wrong. Mm -hmm. I want to broadly open up the discussion of mythology. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, and may maybe it's more that I'm just more my consciousness is tuning into it more um, but it seems to me like myth is having a moment culturally now and um you know you're partially responsible for that from the books that you're writing and you're not the only one there are other people that are that are dealing with this topic do you do you see that also and if so why do you think it is that mythology is having a bit of a renaissance as a concept in society right now it's interesting i mean i do think that there are waves and i think that as young people i think we're probably in a pretty similar generation we always feel like we invented something but there's the mythopoetic men's movement there's the pagan mythic that waves of feminism um there's starhawk there have been a lot of different waves in the 20th century so i think this has been oscillating in and out of consciousness for a while and we have a lot of our elders to thank for laying the foundation and the groundwork for a lot of this research and this thinking um and i although i will say when i was initially writing about myths it was not trendy like it is right now and it was like me and my friend who is a queer mycologist joke that like people don't realize how risky it is to do something that then becomes trendy because like when you first do it it's not actually that trendy <laughs> and you have no like assurance that it's going to catch fire or take on so for me it was just a love um and it's been interesting to see myth explode in in the social media world and the literary world as being something that people are really interested in for me i am always really interested in distinguishing between deracinated myths so cultural myths that are uprooted from their context and their place and become these kind of egregores, like so like these social spirits that have no responsivity to an environmental embeddedness and people forget that they're a myth. They think that they're just the truth. So like capitalism is a myth, um, gender is a myth. All of these things are were stories that emerge from a specific context that then are uprooted and used as you know the figurehead of empire and extractive capitalism. And, um, that's an interesting thing for me. It's like how we can see how myths have been perverted. So I think that there's there's a, a homogenization of myth in the public conversation right now that I don't think is super useful. Like there are different types of myth. For me, I'm interested in the types of myths that are hyper-local, which are always, you know, I, I oftentimes say that, so mycorrhizal fungi, which are the filamentous fabrics that weave together forests, and mushrooms are just that brief reproductive flourish above the ground of these older webs below ground. They don't have a body plan. So Merlin Sheldrake writes about this in Entangled Life in such an interesting way. So they don't have a central brain. They don't have like a node of cognition that controls them. And they don't have, they don't look a specific way. Like they, you pour a mycorrhizal fungi into a forest and it will, its body will branch out to become a map of relationships. <laughs> And it's really a beautiful thing to think about. And for me, myths are like that, which is they are a map of the social and ecological species relationships in a place. So, you know, a lot of historians and anthropologists have shown that myths start out as personified elementals. So they're a way, you, you, a myth is a vessel where you plant your most important environmental information, social information, and you know that it will be kept alive because it's in a good story. The idea of lists doesn't emerge until we have written texts and until we have agriculture way late in human history. Like lists and lineages are not easy to remember. What's much more interesting and easy to transmit generation to generation is a really compelling story with high drama. And so a myth is a really good vessel. It's a boat of breath where you can plant the things you have to remember. Like you have to remember, don't be here in flood season. 
Like, don't eat the berries before you soak them. You'll get diarrhea. Like, seriously, like, minute stuff. They're very and practical. So, they start off very <laughs> practical. Yeah, they're really practical. But when they get uproot empire, the, the problem is the Roman Empire is the best example of this, is the Roman Empire will come, take a myth out of its web of relationships, out of its meaning, translate it into its language, take it away from the context, and then fetishize it, and then use it against the people it took it from. And so the myths that we have today are these are these like perverted weapons that no longer are environmentally responsive. But one of the ways you can reclaim these myths is you can say, where is this myth from? Can I reroute it, rewild it, and retell it? Can I put it back in its sociopolitical, ecological context, its original language? What was happening at the time period? Why would people need this story? And then can I bring in my modern ecological and scientific understanding to kind of zhuzh it for today? Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, I kind of came to the conclusion that myths are basically the first memes. <laughs> Because a meme is really you're encoding a lot of information I into uh, yeah. an easily digestible thing. It's like um, it's encoding, and uh, it's kind of this. The myths are the stories that went viral inside a certain culture, yes. and um, and and it's like it's it's the first sh uh, the tapestry of shared agreements at the heart of a culture, so. Yeah way of putting it yeah from 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 the myth mythology which is the shared understanding of a culture derives the laws and the values and the actual culture that stem and grow out of those myths and it, it seems like when we get too disconnected from those myths or from the ecology of those myths as you state because myths are in almost all cases localized stories and i like one way you express that in the flowering wand so well is that oh well the, the hebrew god was a storm god and that's why he is angry like this is a specific expression from a specific culture and then when you uproot that it becomes just like a mental abstraction that has no real rooted like foundation to it and uh, when we lose our connection to those myths, the, 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 the laws and the values and the culture that are built off of them just become like dead carcasses that are walking around without that mythic intelligence that's actually animating them. Yeah, um, and they also, they don't, I oftentimes say that the truth stays the truth by constantly updating itself, it, you know, it, it, and myths that are kept in oral cultures are every time you bring them back to life, you change them to tailored to your new circumstances, to your audience. I oftentimes use the example of, my favorite example is the Odyssey. So the Odyssey was an oral, we've shown Milman Perry, this incredible classicist created a huge hubbub in the academic scene when he proved that the Homeric texts were created out of epithets and standard standardized episodes and cliches so they could be remembered as oral poetry. Sure. sure. And so we know that the Odyssey begins as an oral poem, and in it, in the microcosm, representing the tradition that creates it, Odysseus retells his story in each new place in a different way. Because he knows that he has to be responding to a different political bias, to different dangers, to different cultural mores. And so we have this great representation of how myth also has to be able to evolve. And it has to be malleable. It has to grow. The other thing that comes to mind is um, mythology. And I, I, I equate mythology to poetry in a lot of ways. And I think a lot about language and I feel like language exists on a spectrum between the the poetic and the dogmatic. Beautiful, yeah. And one thing I love about your writing is 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 I th I mean I have a hard time finishing books these days. And one of the reasons I think besides just like the shorter attention span and this you know addiction to social media etc is I'm not really looking for more information and a lot of books just carry information. But you, your writing really is is poetry, and I feel like in poetry you can say things 
that mere information does not express. There is there's there, there's things you can express in poetry that cannot be expressed with um, literal language. And mythology is similar. Myths are not literally true. They're figuratively true. And in a sense, they point us in the direction of a higher truth than linear dogmatic language is capable of. So I feel like we're at a point in society where everyone, I mean, most people are over here on this dogmatic, literal side of language, and they're fighting over here over whose literal definitions are the most accurate. And that is a, you can't win that game because they're just playing on the wrong side of the, of the, of the battlefield when it's like moving the discourse over away from the literal into the mythic, into the poetic. That's actually how we un unravel <laughs> the mess that we're in by just like re by restoring mythology and poetry to the cultural dialogue. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I oftentimes say that a, a fact, a truth, a certainty is a bad flotation device. And if you're going to be stuck in the ocean for a long time, better to learn how to swim in the fog than to depend on these ideas that become obsolete and deflate really quickly. And so I see people having their idea of the day and then watch them like crumble as it like dissolves. And I think that I love the oblique quality of poetry and storytelling. It's funny that I've become known for a certain kind of academic nonfiction because I don't think it can do the heavy lifting. I think the heavy, heavy lifting is done by beauty medicine, by storytelling, by poetry, by th things that change the way you internally feel. So I oftentimes think of like introception. So we have proprioception, which is like how we feel in the world, how we see, but uh, most of us don't have a well-developed sense of interoception, which is how we internally physically feel. Like how fast is my heart beating? How does my stomach feel? And they've shown there's so much interesting research that people who have a higher ability of interoception are like are better tr financial traders. Like they can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Like you tap into an intuition that's bodily. Like you can read how your body is reading the stimuli of the world and you know a lot more about how to handle the world. But that's also how we read other people, which is people who are good at reading other people are good at imagining inside of their bodies, how other people feel in their bodies. Mm. And I think that one of the we're at a moment in time when we are very bad at humanizing other people, at, or caring about animals and plants and trees, poetry, storytelling, art, helps us to develop that interoceptive empathy of imagining internally what it might be like to be something else, to feel something else. I mean, the funniest thing is that science has an injunction against that anthropocentrism or imagining otherwise. It says that, you know, there's no way that you could ever imagine what a rock is like. That's you're personifying it. Every indigenous tradition has called other beings persons, not because they're blanketing themselves on them. It's because they care about other beings and they want to try and fail what it might be like to be them. And so I think there's, I think poetry, lyricism, um, storytelling can do that oblique work at helping us into our interoceptive intuition better. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I'm curious about why, um, with the flowering wand, um, why you chose, you could have written any myths in the world, you could have, um, you know, um, you know, restored any, any myths you chose, and you, and you chose to focus on the, the, the myths of the masculine. And I'm curious about that decision, It because it feels to me a little bit like, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk about patriarchy and things like this. And it's, you, you can approach that in different ways. You can approach that with, re, you know, re, revolt in, in some sense. Um, but I feel like this book helps to take what has become of masculinity in our society. And it just, it offers an alternative, it offers alternative modes of being. And it, it kind of, it takes that, it take it rewilds the patriarchy in a way and gives men permission to exist and to shape shifts into different forms um, that maybe have become a little taboo in the society that we live in. I would certainly hope so. I will be very 
frank and say there was no plan to this book and it did not even conceptualize it as a book i the way this book the genesis of this book is quite odd um which is i had done years of research on the myth mythologems the mythic systems of the mediterranean basin and so the movement from partnership cultures to dominator cultures the collapse of the bronze age and you know i'm not super interested in this kind of fetishized human divine of divine feminine but i was really interested in how we move from these kind of environmentally responsive more cyclical um cultures to cultures that prize heroic individuals and violence and so that research went into my novel and the madonna secret so that was years and years decades of research for that novel and as someone who had known sexual violence at the hands of men i think when i was first confronted with the divine feminine i saw it as an escape you know and you know hiding can be it's a it's a survival mechanism that works for a little while but not for a long while so by the time i had the pandemic had come around i my book was being rejected for being too feminist and too academic i was quarantining alone i was really sick i was really depressed a bunch of friends had died or committed suicide so i was in grief but like floating grief because i didn't get to go to their funerals didn't get to see them it's a moment of like extreme pressure and i thought to myself i love men more than anything and i'm angrier at them more than anything and that's not useful and i thought you know i can't be mad at someone for living a bad story when they've only been given one story and patriarchy has been conflated with masculinity but they are not the same thing i mean so that's a monomyth and over here we have a biodiversity of expressions that have totally not been acknowledged for centuries and i thought of all my research and i was like what about all the horned gods what about merlin what about the wizards the theriomorphs the spirit workers the storytellers the queers the you know the vegetal gods i was like there's so many though how have we forgotten them they're right there and so i started doing this writing online on social media for free i wrote the whole book in 3 weeks not as a book i would do an i would post an essay a day online to keep myself alive pretty frankly I was just trying to keep myself afloat. I was like maybe no one will read these, but I need to write about what I care about and see if it helps me move. You know we talked about stuck energy. I was like there's stuck energy. I'm stuck. I need to move this. I can do it by sharing my thinking with other people. And you know I had 500 followers. 5000 people had showed up in a week. People wanted more. People were sending me resources and research and books. And so it was like this party of so uh, you know in a lot of ways it was like very unplanned but also so divinely orchestrated like it kept me alive my publisher found me asked for that book i was like do you think oh, yeah all right sure i'll make it a book give me a month um and then i sold my novel finally so it was like this weird a chronological thing but it forced me to do work i wouldn't have ordered off the menu it forced me to get sober with the ways in which i was hiding and and also denying the people in my life i loved most their full humanity like i was raised alongside boys i have a brother and two cousins who are my siblings that are that are men and those are like my closest friends family and i was like you know what i've not been super fair to these guys <laughs> so it was really for them i would say and i love how personal that starts out and then in what 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 you're writing to save your life just ends up saving so many others. I mean, I, I just think so many people have been have been touched by it. I would I'm just hoping we just touch on one of the one story from yeah. from the book. So just 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 to give listeners a, a taste and an example. What does you seem to have a, an, an affinity towards um, many um, masculine myths, but Dionysus is one of them. I'm just I'm just wondering so what what do you think that's a, a myth like Dionysus has to teach our modern society So Dionysus has been submitted to a smear campaign so he is a pre-Greek god he predates the Greek pantheon and the Roman pantheon completely he predates the collapse of the bronze age he probably we the earliest evidence of him is in linear b so the earliest proto-greek on Minoan Crete 
So he was probably associated with the horned gods, with sacred mead making, with bull dancing, with the with a culture that was still barely drawing pictures of human beings, mainly in their art representing other life, the more than human world, the animate everything as I call it. And so Dionysus is still, he's also never, he's not even called a human god, he's referred to as a daemon. He's oftentimes like he's 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 pictured with snakes in his hair, with bull horns, he's always a theriomorph, human animal hybrid. So he actually represents this great ecotone like between the world of, of animals and plants and the world of human beings. And similarly, he oftentimes creates an ecotone between the wilderness and the city. So he always is a stranger. Whenever he arrives, he arrives into a city to create disorder and to challenge kings, despots, people who are taking power incorrectly. So he's always dangerous to empire. And so naturally the Roman empire, after he inspires Spartacus, and Kula Anya, who is this priestess. So he, he inspires the two almost successful revolts against the Roman Empire. They turn him into an old wino and they destroy an outlaw celebration of him, which of course, a much longer story is that all those followers immediately look at Jesus and say, okay, we'll just convert. Because <laughs> um, they seem like they're the same. Um, so <laughs> that's a funny side note. But um, for me, Dionysus represents a masculine archetype that is very mutable, that has a divine relationship to plants, to playfulness, to is an advocate to queers, to women who comes into dominant paradigms and doesn't use the master's tools. He uses pleasure activism. He, you know, I always say he's, he's he always shows up the ivy and the vines that if we actually look at ivy and vines, they come up around these institutions and digest them physically. Like we look at Harvard and all these ivies, these, you know, uh, these lighthouses of patriarchy and they're covered in ivy that is actually destroying the buildings. Um, and so he digests the master's house from the outside. He's always interrupting um, the regular scheduling of violence and oppression and saying, wouldn't you like to have a good time? Um, and his good time is, is, is not, you know, just fun and games. You know, he will, he will come and set things right. And it might not be the right that you feel like is just. And so for me, Dionysus is this way of handing back the thyrsus, which is this flowering wand to the masculine and saying, you don't need a sword. You need vegetal anarchy. You need intersectional um, approaches. You need to collaborate with people who are different than you in order to take down this toxic civilization. I, I love how you can just drop vegetal anarchy, just like in a mid sentence, <laughs> like that's such a awesome term. I actually wrote down um, a line from flowering wand that that, that that articulates this thought um, that I love so much. One of my favorite passages. What if we looked to plants for advice on how to revolt? How can we, like Ivy, begin to encircle the hand that holds the sword until it is so tightly bound it can't help but drop its weapon? Thank you there, for reading. There's a there's a there's a an invitation to men on how to <laughs> how to fight. I hope I hope that there's I also didn't want to be dogmatic, which I didn't want to say there's one targeted approach, which is there are many approaches. And all of us have these figures in our lives or these stories that are going to offer us windows. When the door feels locked, there's a window somewhere. So Dionysus is one, but then we have Merlin, like we have who who says like, you just have to go crazy sometimes, like spend time in the forest and then come back and pretend to be a pig. Like, you know, there's so many different ways to do this. I want to transition into the Madonna secret. And uh, I want to start by asking you what your relationship is with Christianity. <laughs> and I want to start by, um, again, from the flowering wand, but there's this um, amazing passage in the introduction that was really, um, when, I think when I read this paragraph is when I knew that this book was like, uh, you know, of, you know, um, held, held a lot of potency. Um, but I love this description of, of Christianity. Nowhere is this made more clear than in the case of the illiterate magician and storyteller known as Jesus. He has been deracinated from the ecology of Galilee by the empire that later embraced him. 
unlike the vegetal gods Osiris and Dionysus before him, his body did not go back to the forest floor to nourish the fungi and complete the virtuous cycle of decay and renewal. Instead, after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. His body was literally disappeared. No wonder his teachings have been perverted into, into simplistic dogma. Jesus himself is no longer even connected to the earth. Yeah. Uh, so I I'll, like, yeah, just the idea of like, you know, ascension and like disappearing from the earth and just how I, it, it just really speaks to the the idea of mythology being uprooted and perverted into kind of a mental abs abstraction. So just in general, what, um, what are you, what's your relationship to Christianity and, and why did the Mary, the Mary Magdalene story um, emerge as the story that you needed to write? Thank you. Well, I was raised by parents who write about the history of religion, who have create interfaith community, and have a strong desire, had a strong desire as I was growing up to expose me to a lot of different spiritual, esoteric, and religious paradigms with equal respect. But in my house, I was raised by an ex-Buddhist monk who studied the Bible with Theravada Buddhist monks, nuns, eco-anarchists, and rabbis. <laughs> and uh, the other part of my family by marriage were Israeli Jews. And so, and my cousins were all were all Jews. So I had I grew up in a compost heap of primary spiritual documents from every tradition. My parents were always researching the history of religion. They were fascinated with how Christianity becomes the figurehead of empire when it seemed to originate in a much more anti-imperial um, impulse. Um, and so that was definitely like the water I was swimming in. Um, for me, so I, I was not raised Christian. I went to church and asked to go to church because I was curious about it and very quickly found that it, I was not going to get what I wanted there. I was looking for, you know, my mom is very animist and my parents are both very ecologically minded and environmentalist. And, you know, they raised me with a kind of understanding that everything is alive and the whole, the outside, the outdoors, anything I touch is a church. And so going into this little sterile realm and worshiping this man who is dying rather than his beautiful life seemed so antithetical to the love that it was supposed to represent. And I was confused. As a storyteller, I always looked at the story of Jesus and thought it was very strange. And of course my parents were, and I, I grew up alongside the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Da Vinci Code, Margaret Starbird's The Woman with the Alabaster Jar, the Nag Hammadi texts, which are, so these, we have the canonical gospels, which are really late, written in Greek, written by people who were in the empire, the mouthpiece of the empire that killed Jesus. So that's a very bad game of telephone. And, and also we have to remember that they're gospels, they're news. And as we know today, news is always a biased account. So you have to ask who's being made into an enemy. Who is that benefiting? Why is this version of affairs benefiting the writer? And so we have to realize that the New Testament is a Roman text that has been translated. And the Nagamadi text and the Dead Sea Scrolls are compilations of apocryphal texts that are actually earlier and probably represent something closer to the historical Jesus. In them, we have the Gospel of Thomas, which is this collection of the earliest sayings of Jesus, which are really wild. They're like a series of koans or riddles. They have a lot in common with a lot of the teachings in the New Testament, but they're trickier and stranger. And I loved, I loved thinking about how does someone who seemed to be trying to reform Judaism and make it more egalitarian and open to women and to disabled people and to sick people, who was openly challenging empire when it's extremely risky and trying to create a living community of people who shared food and healed each other outside of empire. So really what he was doing is he was saying, you're depending on food and housing from empire that's stolen your land. We're going to create a community that travels where we don't need empire. It's really kind of just like mutual aid. Like he was really just thinking practically, like how do we, figure out ways to feed and heal each other at a time period when empire is actively trying to kill us. Mm. Um, and, and can we do it with everybody without, without exiling the women 
and the whores and the lepers? Can we really try and invite everybody into this experience? Um, and I was always curious about how that person suddenly becomes the figurehead of sexism, ecocide, <laughs> empire, militarism. Like, what? How does it happen? So I was curious historically about that translation and also very much inspired by, you know, the red tent by Anita Diamond. I was always, oh, I always wondered why we know in the Gospel of Philip that the women supported the ministry. Financially, his ministry was supported by wealthy Jewish women. We know in the earliest text that he calls Mary Magdalene the apostle of the apostles. He calls her his, her, his koinonos, which meant divine partner. Um, he kisses her on the mouth in the Gospel of Philip. We know that to be a Jewish teacher at the time period and to be unmarried would have meant that no one would have trusted you. <laughs> um, so I was curious about these questions and really wanted to write a story that brought back to life the ecological and the social complexity of that moment, the humans, the women, the midwives, the whores, the slaves, like what were those people going through? And, and to try and take off the mistranslations of empire. And the real impulse behind it is we live in a very throwaway culture. So when we label something toxic, we don't, we just think we can throw it away, but it's going to go somewhere. And so many of us, religion has been used against us. And the impulse is to want to throw it away. But the more radical thing to do is to compost. So for me, this novel is my way of composting Christianity, trying to heal the wound, heal, heal how this man was. He seems, in order to command the attention of a traumatized, illiterate population of Galilean Jews who have seen their family members murdered like every week for hundreds of years, you had to be an embodied kinetic speaker. You had to be like a powerhouse. And then suddenly we like see this anemic, like white, like sickly man with long blonde hair. Like, no, like let's give Jesus back his body. Let's give scripture back its body. Beautiful. And I love that you chose to um, write about Mary Magdalene. I feel like she, her, her meme and her myth is so strong right now. And just for you, you know, for your touch and for your perspective and your poetic writing to take on that story. I just knew that was going to be such a powerful, you know, yes. combination. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a, a staple in the canon of, of Mary Magdalene for years to come. I, I certainly um, hope it will and movies and all that stuff. But tell tell, tell us about Mary Magdalene. Um, what does she mean to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the historical, you know, I, I, I did grow up in, in the Christian church and, um, I guess the, it kind of glosses over Mary Magdalene. I think she's usually referred to as a prostitute and, you know, kind of one of his, one of Jesus disciples. And there's really not much, um, importance given to her, his, uh, traditionally in, 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 in the, the new version of whatever Christianity has become. So tell us what Mary Magdalene means to you and, and, and how your novel reclaims her story. She actually shows up more than almost any other character in all, even in the Roman rewrites that can't erase her. She, if she's showing up that much in a patriarchal culture that's trying to rewrite the story, then she must have showed up even more before, which Good we point. see she, there's, she is much more in the gospel of Philip. She is the teacher of the disciples. Mm -hmm. She's the person Jesus uses as his like, you know, surrogate teacher. Um, and she she's always given a lot of importance in any other text other than the canonical gospels. Even in the canonical gospels, she's at the tomb. She's only only one at the crucifix. She's the one anointing him, washing his feet. She's the one listening to him, asking him questions. So she is really present. In the sixth century, Constantine. So Constantine initially Christianity is demonized, and there are biodiversity of different Christian traditions. Most of them are women led. All in fact, and women ran to this this kind of this counterculture because they were allowed to the table in a lot of the early pictures of christian meetings that are done in catacombs women are the ones serving the sacrament um and a lot of people have gone in and defaced these pictures in recent years um to try and erase them but thank god um archaeologists took pictures um but for me you know the Mary, Mary Magdalene represents something really, really interesting also, which is she has existed in folklore. Like she was erased from 
the dominant, yeah, and so let me return to in the sixth century when Constantine comes in, decides Christianity will become the religion of empire. He, he, he sets something in motion, which is that suddenly we need to change this radical anti-imperial religion into something that works for a male-led militaristic paradigm. And it means that we need to sideline the women who have been in power. And if they're seeing their, if their role model is Mary Magdalene, we need to discredit her. So famously, Pope Gregory gives this sermon where he conflates the unnamed sinner woman in Luke who wasn't even a prostitute. The word used for her probably denoted some kind of, she either had an illness or was a hairdresser. So like, even the jump to making her a prostitute is like, well, pa many mistranslations passed. Sure. So conflates the unnamed sin sinner woman of, of Luke with Mary Magdalene. And he knowingly does that. He knows this is a mistake and he does it. And it sticks. Wow. And he they really, really, the Roman Empire does a really big job of trying to say she's sinful. She um, was a whore. I mean, I actually think that she's so powerful that she's like, yeah, give me the whores. I love them. I love sex workers. Mm. We're, we're, we're more powerful together. Great. Mm. So I think she like, actually, I think she's so wild. I think she's so powerful and so outside of the dominant paradigm that she doesn't reject that. She says, okay, yeah, these women definitely need a hero. That's and part sure. of her. She's composting that story. Yeah. She, so she's half, I, I oftentimes say like, yeah, she could be a prostitute. She's fine with that. Um, she doesn't, she doesn't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's you who think, you know, you know, she's, she'll throw it back at you. It's amazing. That That's how I feel about her at least. But I also do think that in France, in Europe, up until the mass, up until the Crusades and the you know the destruction of the Templars and the the genocide of the Cathars, you have a a real dense undercurrent of belief that Mary Magdalene was a spiritual equal to Jesus, and there's a real you can see it in iconography, in paintings, in folklore, in everything. You know, in, in France, the folklore is she's more important than Jesus, pretty much in France in terms of shrines and rituals and folklore. And, you know, it took the church really hard work to go in and exterminate that again and again. And so for me, you don't get folklore that dense without a germ, without a seed. I have to think that there's so much, there's so much myth about her. There's so much of a sense that she was someone who was important to Jesus and some sort of spiritual equal that we don't get that from nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. And it might be, you know, we can't know the truth, but we can reclaim the sense that she was a key character. Yeah. Well, I, I can't wait to see what your book does to her continued legacy because she seems to be, I mean, I just, I just know so many people that love her, like deeply love her and go to Mary, go on Mary Magdalene pilgrimages to France. And um, yeah, I'm just excited for your book to, to um, just to continue to perpetuate a new story. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and just and just talk a little bit about just Sophie the person. Um, what what's your average day like? Like, what do you you live in the Hudson Valley? Um, I'm sure you're doing a lot of podcasts and promotion for your books now. But what 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 sort of um, personal hobbies and daily activities make up the life of Sophie Strand? No one asks me that. Thank you, James. <laughs> um. I wake up very early. My organism wakes me up very early. So I try and go to sleep earlier to account for that. But I wake up with the sunset and immediately have to take out my tiny dog <laughs> to go pee. So that's part of my spiritual work as I go take my dog out to pee and make my coffee. In my mornings, I do this prayer where I summon by name every being, fungal, vegetal, insect, landform, folkloric being ancestor in a 20 mile radius. So that's like my version of like a centering prayer meditation is I summon my extended mind, my extended network of beings. And I oftentimes do that while I drink coffee or I go, I, I do a run every morning for my, it's part of my cardiac health and health issues is I have to go on a run, which I usually try and do outside. And then I write. And writing for me is hygiene. So like pretty much every morning, these are my control rods in the like overheating nuclear factory of my insane, <laughs> of my insane life is I have to, I have to run. I have to say my prayers, my weird feral prayers, and I have to write. And if I get those done, 
then it's really important for me to spend as much time as I can outside, hiking, walking, seeing friends. Um, yeah, and I, I read a fair amount too. Um, unfortunately, my health, you know, sometimes will make me have to deal improvise. And so my health is very unexpected and unpredictable. So sometimes things, there are appointments, there are tests I have to do. So if I'm being less precious about my life, oftentimes I have to wake up and drive to go get a blood test or spend four hours on the phone negotiating with insurance. So um, but one of the things I love, and I did a lot of before the pandemic and I'm beginning to do again, is I love to host. Hosting is my favorite thing. Like making the food, lighting the candles, having the playlist, like I, nothing makes me happier. So I've been leaning back into doing that and it, yeah, sharing food, sharing space with people and then asking them for their ghost stories or supernatural stories. Oh, That's fun. What is, so going back to your, your, your writing routine, yeah. do you have a writing process. Um, do you, do you have a certain, um, place that you write a certain music you listen to do you write in a notebook versus a computer do you work are you do you work on um, specific projects or is it kind of different day to day just kind of break down your writing process for us a little bit hmm. yeah it depends on the project and you know there was a time in my life where I was working on like my ghost writing and my book and so there was like a clear divide like I'll do this in the morning this in the afternoon. Now I have articles, essays, a book manuscript due in December. You know, I have so many things in the air that it's like every day I like try and figure out what the hierarchy of needs is. How I work though is if I'm writing fiction, I have to write 500 words a day. So if I'm writing a long fiction project, I have to, even if I throw them out the next day, to complete a project like that, I need an outline. I need a sense of where I'm going and I need to make tracks on it every day and if I miss a day I can enter like I, it's hard to get the grindstone moving again and so I really even if it's terrible writing I try and keep it moving with nonfiction, it's a little bit different and I've been doing a lot of nonfiction, which is with nonfiction. there's so much research involved and composting so oftentimes there'd be like three days where I'm writing but I'm really like pasting paragraphs in a word document shuffling them failing and then on the third day, I'll write like 3000 words in an hour. So like there's, that's a little bit more unpredictable. But one of the things I love is I love like certain kinds of tells. Like I always light a candle and a candle with a specific smell that I don't light any other time. So smell for me is a very important at evoking something. And it also lets my brain know that like I'm in the work zone. I also work at my kitchen table, even though I have a study that always ends up happening no matter where I am. And I have, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see, but I have a really beautiful view. Yeah, I love that. And I play music and I, I create different playlists for different work I'm working on. I, it's one of my favorite things to do is to like feel into the music that will lay a foundation for something. Yeah, and I, I light the candle, music, I sit. And I try not to answer emails before I do it. The, my one piece of advice is any energy I put towards answering emails is directly taken away from my writing. So any answering of emails has to happen afterwards. Oh yeah, for me, my creative space and I would just say my my workspace are very different. Like creative huh. space, it's like, I don't even want to be on my computer. I'm just, my. it's just a notebook. You're right, yeah, okay. It's a notebook and an, um, a pot of herba mate and some instrumental music. And it's like channeling time. And I meditate before I go into that space. And then I, it's just channeling and trying to connect with the muse of whatever project I'm working on. And yeah. then in the afternoon, I'll have coffee and maybe like email and do and do like actual like work work. Um. Okay, so last question that I have for you. Uh, uh, there's this exercise I love to do called plant a vision. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we live in a world that has a lot of problems and we need new solutions and we need to build new solutions. But before we can build solutions, we need to plan solutions. Before you can plan a solution, you need to imagine a solution. So this is the role of artists, of poets, of writers, is to plant the visions that can be taken and planned and eventually built. So forget about how, that's not part of the exercise. 
Um, but if you, not to put you on the spot, but if you could just offer a, a brief vision that you could plant in this conversation um, on, uh, we'll just say a better world, um, what 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 is your vision for that world look like? You know, it's kind of small and precious, which is I have a lot of friends right now who are new mothers and friends who are recent mothers. And even though they are very feminist and in really egalitarian, amazing relationships, they are struggling. And I think I... I would love to be a mother someday. I don't know if my, with my physical health and my circumstances, that would be possible. But it's something I think, I think about motherhood a lot or like in a non-gendered way. I think about being a person responsible for another little being, bringing it into the world in this time. And I think about how physically exhausting and isolating it is. And I think something I've been really trying to feel into is how can we create communities that hold mothers and are surrounded by grandmothers? Like, I really, really, like where everything centers grandmothers, the elders, the elephant grandmothers and the, and the elephant whales, you know, that, you know, we see these whale pods, these elephant groups fall apart when the grandmother wisdom d it dies. Mm. Like, how can we center grandmothers, grand elders, grand queers, in our in our communities like really in every decision everything we do every party we have like <laughs> um every event the elders are in a circle around us and we are supporting feeding nourishing new mothers like i that feels so important to me um increasingly so like how can i as a young person who's childless there's such an impulse to like want to turn away from that and to turn away from the pain of, of people who are really on the front lines in terms of like physical exhaustion and navigating uncertainty and the long game of climate change that kids represent. And so I think the vision I wanna plant and plan and pray towards, move towards is community that is a ring of grandmothers around a nucleus of mothers and mm. in a non-gendered way. Um, for me, it's more about that, like anyone can do it, that kind of like caretaking energy, that post-menopausal, post-reproductive energy, encircling these people who have used their bodies and their time to care for offspring. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, I, I heard a, I heard that there was, a, there. Were, I don't know how true this is, you always hear stories about, you know, what, what, what took place in indigenous cultures, um, but I've heard that in certain indigenous cultures, there were um, like a council of grandmothers. That's that... what I was thinking of. Yeah, I keep thinking about, and I also think about how I haven't had that in my life. Like a lot of the female elders in my life were died, you know, because of, you know, my grandmother died of glyphosate poisoning because she guarded, she's an English woman who gardened her roses with glyphosate. You know, and I think about all of the elders in my life who I wish were there to give me wisdom and um how so many of us are with without that that cushion and that perspective absolutely um sophie this has been such a treat i've been looking forward to talking with you for a long time so thank hey. you so much for coming on to the podcast um do you have time to read us um yeah. your poem as an as, as, a, as a closing offering to the listeners i am a little embarrassed reading poetry to you i feel like you are the the, the poet king but i'll read some poems um and i just wanted to say like i just so admire your work and you're also i just you bring such a welcome sense of humor to art that's so light and i think that like humor medicine trickster medicine is what we need and i just bow to the way you do it it's impeccable um back at you <laughs> so here's a poem it's called epiphany loop of snake Flax droop of a hawk on the white cedar's longest arm. Two swallowtails love dance traces again and again the bow of infinity in the humid air. I thought I would love once, twice, precise as a comet's rare streak across the heavens in a human lifetime. But here I am, dawn struck, wonder hushed seeing my heart wasn't saved or whole, 
but made to be split open like the milkweed pod and scattered. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Sophie. The Flowering Wand and the Madonna Secret are both available now. I'll link them in the show notes. And once again, such a such a treat um, speaking with you today. Thanks again. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Have a lovely um, start of your September. <laughs>